jsou tady Let's Explore even more of questionable USB phone chargers or chargers for any USB charged devices. There is absolutely never enough of these. Who may show some safe ones people call for the dodgy ones and who may show some dodgy ones people call for the safe ones. These ones I guess are more likely to be dodgy but let's take a look at them and explore them. This one is a quick charger supplying 5, 9 or 12 volts, about 18 watts for each. And let's try to test it, let's try to load it using my test load and measure the current and voltage using this. Of course now it's at 5 volts. It should have up to 3 amps current capability. It actually goes up to about 2 point. 5, 6, and it shuts down. Trying to auto detect what charging modes it supports. Auto detection running, and in the middle of the auto detection it shuts down for some reason. I gave it a couple more tries, and now it's working. You can see what it auto detected here. Seems like it should be able to supply up to 12 volts. And the voltage went up to 12 volts. Doesn't go farther, of course. And what current it can supply at 12 volts? One arm up, and then the voltage is dropping. 11.3 volts, 10, 9, 8. Not really 1.6 amps, as it claims. Now let's try 9. Should supply 2 arm ups, and it can supply 1.2. Two nine, and then it's dropping. Eight point six volts, seven point seven. And this one can't really supply what it claims here. So let's try to open it somehow. It comes out, and that's it. Switching to a smaller tripod and let's take a closer look at it. The mains comes in here. It goes via a fusible, maybe fusible resistor for inrush current limitation and maybe fire safety. The smoothing capacitor, electrolytic one, 400 volt, 10 micro. Some small capacitor here. The chip, which is through hole. And then there is this switching transformer. Some auxiliary capacitor on the primary side, a low voltage one, an optocoupler and capacitor between the primary and secondary side. On the secondary side two electrolytic capacitors, which is better than one. A diode for rectification, probably a shot key, a big one. But it's probably going to get bloody hot. If it was supplying three amps, this would be dissipating quite a lot of heat and typically fast chargers that supply three amps use a synchronous rectifier instead to reduce the heat losses. And there is a communication chip so it can actually negotiate the voltage and supply different voltages, some voltage reference, I guess, some small capacitors and resistors in the voltage sensing circuitry, a discharging resistor for the capacitor. The isolation distance is sort of kind of. The properly safe ones typically have doubled the distance you can see here, but I have also seen much worse. And here's the bridge rectifier installed a bit at an angle, and a diode, a resistor, capacitor, and that's it. As I expected, the tiny 3-pin chip is for 3-1 voltage reference. Here is the communication chip and here is the switching chip, the optocoupler and the capacitor between the primary and secondary side. A 2.2 nanofarad capacitor rated 2 kV, which is better than the 1 kV capacitor I often see in the dodgy ones, but still not a safety rated class Y1 capacitor as it should be. Of course, let's test it in a dodgy way and connect an oscilloscope here. Loading it at 0.9 amps and now 5 volts, 9 volts, 12 volts, back to 9, back to 5. And of course measuring the voltage on the secondary winding. In a dodgy way and it's actually in a discontinuous conduction mode. 12 volts is 0.2 amps, 0.3 amps. 0.5 amps, 0.7 amps, 0.9 amps. And going over 1 amp actually makes the voltage drop at the output. And you can see this part of it going lower. Less load, more load. And this is actually what goes into the rectifying diode and into the secondary capacitors. 
and this pulse is when the transistor is on, and the secondary diode is in reverse, of course, during this, because it's a flyback switching power supply. Let's keep it running with the cover on it, as it normally does, and then let's look at it using a thermal camera. Now it supplies about 4.7 volts at 2.3 amps, and after about an hour it's bloody hot and I can smell it. And let's quickly open it and take a look into it using the thermal camera, and... Here's the rectifying secondary diode, which is 153 degrees Celsius. Bloody hell! And of course the maximum temperature of the silicon in it is 150 degrees Celsius, and the silicon dye inside of it is always hotter than the surface. So this is running well above its specification. Bloody hell! Here is the capacitor, which is only 120 degrees Celsius about. Poor electrolytic capacitor. And the transformer winding, 144 degrees Celsius, 147, bloody hell. The chip is just 141 degrees Celsius, just. And the other side of the board, there's a bloody hot resistor and a diode in the snubber network, I guess. And of course the board under the secondary diode is hot. The rest of it is sort of cool. So this is the thermal image of it, together with my test load. And this thing's absolutely baking itself. The poor diode is completely roasted at 2.3 amps. Imagine if it was actually able to supply 3 amps, as it claims. The absolute maximum current I can get from it is 2.76 amps, but under this load it supplies barely 4 volts. 177 degree. Nice! And of course this capacitor is mostly heated by the diode, not by its own power dissipation and... Now let's take a look at the transformer, which has six pins, but two of them are unused, so the chip probably doesn't require an auxiliary winding for its operation. But now of course let's desolder the transformer and explore it. This thing can't possibly bake it more than it already is. It's a flyback switching power supply, so there should be a gap in the middle, which there is. And now let's open the winding. There's a sticky tape on the top, one layer, two layers. And this is probably the secondary, made of several thinner wires. I don't see any obvious gaps in the initialization under it. So let's remove it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven turns. And nice insulation under it. But of course it would be even better if there was a safety insulated secondary, not just a secondary made of ordinary lacquered wires, where the lacquer is super thin, like 0, 0.00 something millimeters. Even a tiny gap in this insulation could allow one of the strands to fall to the primary and make a short, bringing the minus voltage to the output. And then the insulation, one layer, probably two layers, but it breaks. It's sort of baked onto the winding, of course. And here is probably the primary. One, two, three, eight, 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 nine, nine, nine turns of a 0 0.2 millimeter wire. And the seven turn secondary is using the same wire, but seven strands is in parallel. So let's sum it up. The transformer isolation is sort of kind of okay, but a safety insulated secondary would be way better. It can't supply the current it claims and it's extremely overheating. There's a non-safety capacitor between the primary and secondary side. And besides this capacitor there is no interference suppression. So the conclusion is... Dodgy! And the other one, a small one, 1 amp, 5 volts only. So let's plug it in and test it. With no load and the voltage seems to be a bit fluctuating. 5.36, 5.18, 5.38. It's about 0 0.2 volts up and down. But anyway, let's try to load it. 0 0.2 amps is... What? 0 0.4 amps and it's shutting down or 
supplying too little voltage for this meter. And at certain loading currents, the voltage at the output is a bit too high. 5.6 something volts. At 0.4 amps, this dumb charger is really living to its fullest. So let's leave it running like this for a while. It's running for a bit over two hours and still no infant mortality. So let's dissect it alive. Should be easy. And that's it. And I guess this one supplies such a low power that it can't even be getting hot. But let's check it. Here's the transistor getting hot and a resistor also on the primary side and the transformer is cool. And on the secondary side there is the diode getting hot and otherwise not many other hot components. And on the other side of it you can see areas heated by the through hole components because there are no SMD components in this one. So that's the thermal image of it running and now let's take a closer look at it. It's purely through hole, no SMD components and it's discrete, no chips in it. Just one diode as a rectifier, a smoothing capacitor, couple transistors, three resistors, one capacitor here, another ceramic capacitor here, the transformer optocoupler, the secondary electrolytic capacitor, the USB port, one diode here. This is the main secondary diode and this is the bottom of the board with absolutely no SMD component and there is this printed fuse, which is the only fuse in it. Bloody hell! And of course here is the isolation gap and this isolation distance, this is on the secondary side, this is on the primary side. Amazing! Calling this one millimeter would be quite generous. And let's also appreciate the quality of this solder joint here. That's a quality. And the solder joint is this ceramic capacitor here. Let's take a look at the electrolytic one, just 2.2 micro. And the secondary one is 220 micro, 10 volts. And of course, yes, this tiny ceramic non-safety capacitor is between the primary and secondary side. One nanofarad, one kilovolt. I'm just quickly looking at the secondary on an oscilloscope. This is fully loaded and reducing the load. It's not reducing the duty cycle. It seems to be running in bursts now. This is kind of a crappy design, isn't it? But anyway, I think we have seen enough, except of course the autopsy of the transformer, which I have to desolder and look into it. I really expect an absolute pinnacle of switching transformer quality and especially safety. Quite a small ferrite core. Does it have an air gap? Maybe very, very small. And now let's explore the winding. Yes. And there's a tape on the top with gaps, of course. And all the windings with no insulation in between, basically. And the secondary isn't really shorter to the primary or auxiliary, but. The windings are isolated just by the lacquer on the wire, which was never meant to be a safety insulation, never meant for applications where its failure causes an electric shock. But if this insulation breaks down, the lacquer, which is just 0.00 something millimeters thick, you get a minus voltage at the output of the charger and in your phone. One more look at it even closer before I unwind the windings. And winding probably the auxiliary from it, which seems to be sitting right on the secondary. And of course remember the auxiliary is on the primary side, not isolated from mains. And yes, with no insulation under the auxiliary there is the secondary. Now removing the secondary, which is the thickest wire and typically the least number of turns in a 5 volt charger. And there is an insulation under it, but with a massive gap. 
Here's the useless insulation with all the gaps in it. And the primary under it. Here is one terminal of the auxiliary winding which was not isolated from the secondary by anything else than just the locker. And this terminal is connected straight to the mains via this dodgy fuse. And of course one of the terminals of the secondary goes straight to the USB port. And this is definitely one of the worst chargers I can imagine. No proper fuse, no inrush current limitation, no interference suppression. It can't even supply half of the current it claims. Very small isolation distance on the board. Quite questionable capacitor between the primary and secondary side. And the windings in the transformer isolated just by the super thin lacquer on the wire. So the conclusion is... Super dodgy! And this is a very old design. I have already reverse engineered the schematics of very similar chargers several years back. But I'm thinking about reverse engineering this one. And the first charger is now reverse engineered. The mains comes in via a resistor, a bridge rectifier, this smoothing capacitor. There's no auxiliary winding, just the primary with a snubber network. This switching chip which does everything. With no auxiliary it probably internally drops a voltage for its operation and stores it in this capacitor. And there's a small decoupling capacitor for the optocoupler. Here's the feedback pin. This interference suppression capacitor preventing a common mode interference at the output. Basically a return path for the capacitive current coupled from this winding to this one. And the secondary is here rectified and smooth. Here's some discharging and loading resistor. Here's the voltage negotiating chip with a negative pin, positive with some noise filter. Two pins going to the data pins of the USB port. One unused and one to basically skew the voltage divider in this feedback circuitry with TL431. Normally this resistive divider is set to slightly over 5 volts, because the threshold voltage of 431 is 2.5 volts. But I guess this chip can actually add a parallel resistance to this one, reducing the resistance and, and thus increasing the total voltage necessary to reach 2.5 volts here. And a series resistor of the optocoupler LED, some parallel resistor so it doesn't light up at a low current. This one basically bypasses the LED at a low current, which this one basically uses for its operation. And this negative feedback capacitor for stability, basically a very simple PID regulation. And that's basically it. Now the detail of the feedback circuitry on the board. Note the precision resistors in the divider, with a weird marking like 01D or 96C. But it can be decoded using my online calculator. For example, 96C is 97.6 kilo ohms and 01D is 100 kilo ohms. So that's it, another two pieces for our collection of electrocution house burners. And of course if you like my videos please consider supporting this channel on Patreon, subscribing and using the thanks button. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. You make this channel possible.